Okay, so I would like to thank everyone um, to joining us for this lunch session. And it's part of our series where we talk to some of our most inspiring alumni from the 2008 to 2010 class as they discuss how they steered their careers to succeed and to success through the challenges and difficulties of the last recession. And using examples from their own careers, invited alumni will discuss the opportunities that emerge in times of adversity and how to build a resilient practice to ensure longevity and sustainability. And we're lucky to join, be joined today by Stephanie Edwards, who is an architect, urbanist and co-founder of Urban Symbiotics. An insight and research led to multidisciplinary design practice that focuses on the user experience through innovate architecture, master planning and the public realm. Urban Symbiotics have been recognized by the Design Museum and the London Festival of Architecture as a practice for their architecture for a new generation. Um, by also being nominated for an Age 100 Architecture Design Award. Stephanie is elected council member of Riva and was also celebrated as a force for change by Vogue alongside Barons Lawrence in 2019 seminal September issue. And my name is Huna Kaipos and I graduated this past summer. So today is really meant as a meeting where we can informally ask questions to Stephanie um, after her presentation. And therefore, I would like to ask everyone who has just joined to turn on their cameras so that we can make this as personal as possible, how this medium allows us to be, and also give Stephanie a bit of an idea of her audience. And after her presentation, you can ask questions and by raising um, your Zoom hand and I will unmute you, or you can um, ask questions in the chat and I will read them out there. So I would like to hand over now to Stephanie. Thank you. Um, great to be here. Um, yeah, really great to be here and to see everyone here. Good to see Carlos as well, my former tutor. <laughs> um, so what I'd, what I'd like to talk to you, I'll start sharing my screen, um, but I'd, what I'd like to talk to you today about is um, just how I've navigated over the last 10 years. So um, I graduated in 2010, um, does feel like quite a long time ago now. But what I'd like to, um, I'd like to go back and start in 2007, um, because it was a very different time. Um, in 2007, I just completed my part one. And so I started working for the Office for Metropolitan Architecture at OMA in Rotterdam. And it was just a very different time. Um, Dubai was the place that every architect um, was in, it was their playing field. Every architect was trying to do the most. Um, we had several palms, we had the world that was being constructed. And at OMA, we were working on a place called Waterfront City, which looked at, instead of actually extruding into the water, creating an inland island. And so we were working on um, a very playful um, way of looking at the 21st century, knowing that Dubai had no street life, um, a limited population and not much happening, but a lot of architecture and building. And we were looking at the generic and the iconic actually of coming, you know, moving forward of developing death stars and pixelated um, spheres and iconic architecture and iconic architecture, but without people. Um, iconic architecture, which was all about form um, and some function, but actually it was really about a playing ground of, of architects just doing what they fancy doing in a space that was um, very open to them. And so then moving back to 2008, uh, this was the time of the global recession and we were all very happy to be studying. Um, so I moved back and I was in Dip 10 and um, I worked on the city of Misuse with Carlos and um, this is a real focus on on people and how people really use space, on looking at um, the timetables of space, of the program of space, how direct action could actually start to change and facilitate growth, um, facilitate a new way of being in space. But also um, I was looking at if you're misusing a city, how do you enable that? And how do you actually start to create, sorry for the pixelated, um, Diagrams, but how do you actually start to create a program of use and a new interactive street that actually, instead of um, hiding away from that, that actually started to celebrate that? So this is my real focus about people, cities, and urbanism. And um, 
I would say I brought some of the aspects of um, OMA into this, but it was more about actually really getting to grips and what's under the skin of people and places. So in 2010, um, we all graduated um, from DIP10 and we were all very excited, but um, after that, it was quite a hard time. Um, it was quite difficult, actually. There was a place of a lot of speculative jobs. Um, I was offered many places that, of jobs that didn't actually come through. Um, I was offered um, to work for places that, for free, um, which I didn't take up, um, which I don't think we ever should. But actually, um, at times of downturn, I think there are some great opportunities that do come up and there is a real focus of what's important. And I think actually, if we look at the focus now, it's not necessarily a well, recession may be coming and the focus is on something different, but there is a real focus on people. And so I found myself in Stockholm um, working on a project called Connecting Stockholm. So Stockholm is very segregated physically, but actually very segregated um, ethnically, very segregated socially. And so actually we worked with the constraints that we had as a collaborative team by actually um, working out of an office, um, not of an office, but of a public space. We put our office in the center of Stockholm so that we could speak directly to people. We could speak to the people that worked in Stockholm. We could speak to the people that lived in Stockholm, the children that, um, that played there. And actually we began to really start to get to the grips of why Stockholm was as disparate and as, um, as segregated as it was and to come up with solutions, um, but not just as designers, um, but with the people themselves. So we looked at actually how do we start to facilitate some of these connections across the water by looking at providing affordable housing in bridges, but also about how do you create more spaces for collaboration, spaces for people to come together um, and social programming. How do you start to make places more affordable and more accessible? And actually how you start to create places that people can create, you know, call their own, not necessarily asking people to design it themselves, but actually making them feel as if they actually have um, a voice and also a, a place to actually call their own that they actually have agency over. And so in 2011, um, I got a proper job, <laughs> but actually focusing on urbanism. And again, um, this is working for a Middle Eastern firm, but we're still looking at the desert, but in a different way. Um, knowing with the economic downturn, this focus now was actually about how do you create a place that is sustainable and not reliant on oil. Um, we worked with creating sustainable cities, but also looking at passive, um, passive design, looking at ensuring we're looking at vernacular principles, at passive calling, actually creating communities on the ground that could work, using indigenous planting to create new public spaces. Um, and new focal homes. But also we worked with the Sahara um, Forest Project. This is um, a new technology that was being piloted in, um, in Qatar. So we visited them and worked together with them to create this new plan. They were looking at evaporative cooling from the sea um, in order to start to green the desert and actually start to create functional um, greening of the desert and how we could work together with them but also responding to some of the inhumane conditions that a lot of South Asian workers were brought into some of the Emirates and desert places about how to create humane places for them to live, for them to build community, to have sufficient shading, to have places that aren't just um, porter cabins in the middle of the desert. Um, and creating new um, ways of looking forward, of looking at souks um, in a way that is more future looking um, places that can enable sustainable and walk, walkable environments whilst creating forward thinking places. And then forward, uh, go moving on to urban symbiotics. So it's very much a focus on during the time, I feel like these times really bring points to test. Um, so I tested looking at strategic plans and tested looking at different ways of desert development and working also in West Africa and South America. Um, I tested working with people, but now at Urban Symbiotics, we've now decided, we're very a young practice now, we've started to look at how we can bring those together to actually bring people and cities together that can actually work and function on different scales, 
And so now I'd just like to go through just our approach and what, how we're trying to look at responding to the context, responding to people in a way that is quite, is sustainable and does focus on, on what we feel is necessary right now. Um, so at the moment, we feel like people are at the sidelines, some insights used into design, but design is very much the focus when we come to master plan, regeneration um, and architecture. But actually at Urban Symbiotics, we're trying to look at how do you actually put these with, with equal weighting, having sufficient people engaged, um, the right people, so that you get sufficient insight to actually design something that is relevant and that works for, um, for the future. And so I co-founded um, co Urban Symbiotics with a product designer. And so we're looking at a product design process of using a product design approach to architecture and design by bringing people in first, by using them through focus groups and through research in order to develop um, our designs further. So instead of the design process where we continue them as architects and designers and have engagement at the end, we're pioneering looking at continuous engagement right from the beginning, throughout the process and to the end. We're starting with engagement and participation through focus group, demographic insights, through insight and design, and then finally to validation and implementation to actually see if what we're designing actually works. So stakeholder mapping, this is um, extremely important and we're doing this in Croydon, we're doing a regeneration framework there and, and, and some other areas that we're working on too, whether that's social influences, landowners, community groups, housing association, local government, we're ensuring we're mapping them all because we really need to understand how to get to them and what the most appropriate way is to do that. We know that limited stakeholders are usually involved, so we want to increase that. But we also, particularly in the UK, know that very limited people um, become involved in shaping their own spaces. It's particularly those who are retired, over 65. You have limited young people who are involved, um, less than 20%. You have um, hardly any social renters actually are involved in how they're shaping their environments. And those, um, and it generally tends to be most of the population. So in any project we work on, we are focused on ensuring we have that demographic um, information so that we can always be testing ourselves as to whether we are um, living up to actually focusing and engaging with the right population. So this is some information we're looking at in Purley where we were told that age is predominantly an older population but it just isn't necessarily true and we believe that actually it's about research to get there. But it's about these opportunities to really start to change and think about how um, as designers, we really do ensure we, we are inclusive. And um, so, yeah, this is in order to get that full community representation. And so engagement and participation, we are about building capacity to participate. As designers, I guess we're really thinking about, especially at these times, we can design, but we can also teach people to understand what, we're, what we are doing, um, but also how they can be involved in participating in a, in a full way. Um, having the appropriate format, whether that is in a public space, um, whether that's about going to um, particular people or coming to the level and really trying to understand someone's view from their point of view, or going to, um, you know, having online platforms, but actually it's usually a mix of um, a range of formats, but also communication, using the right language, talking to people in the right way, sometimes it's about drawing, sometimes it's about language, um, as we all know, we're all on Zoom continuously, but how do we make this a real collaborative platform? We're pioneering how we're trying to work out how to really start to engage and co-solve on these platforms too. So insight and design. Um, this is um, a project in Purley and Croydon, a regeneration framework, where we're really trying to make sure that what we find out is put into the local plan. It is um, worked out into our designs. So we use insight analysis to really start to understand and um, decipher what is happening in different areas. How are people experiencing their spaces? What are their fears? What are their aspirations? What do these streets mean to me and to them? And what are the cues that can either be quite exclusive from the space or also those that are um, unwittingly sometimes exclusive? 
Um, participating in co-solving, we're not about necessarily telling people they need to design the place for us, but it's just about bringing them to help us co-solve some of the issues they're facing and that we're facing as designers. Um, and then validation and implementation, ensuring that actually we're feeding back what is happening. It's no point asking if you don't go back and talk to them. Um, and then legacy formation. So at the moment, it's about ensuring that communities can come together to make changes. It's not just about us providing reports that can be put onto the shelf, um, but we're creating panels. So at the moment where we put together a, demo, a full demographic mix of people um, together, to actually form that demographic mix that reaches the set that actually reflects the same um, bar graphs and demographics. Like how do we're actually looking at ways to continue, help that group continue. So we're doing that for a future Pearly and Pearly panel group at the moment. So we're doing that for Croydon, but we're also doing it for the Gascoigne estate, um, which I don't know if you know is one of the largest estates in East London. Um, of helping people to ensure that they are constantly involved in the process. Um, so projects, I'll whistle through this um, very briefly. It's about projects in process, and I'm going to just talk to you about two different scales. So we were, um, we were one of our first projects as Urban Symbiotics was to look, was to look at our MATI vision for 2030, which moved to 2050 with the local government in Almaty and Kazakhstan, and also with Hatch Regenerative a, an Economics Group. So we work together with them to um, actually trying to define what um, the vision is for Almaty. And so we said, actually, you need to bring people to the fore. We need to speak to your developers, your landowners, your community groups. And they told us in Kazakhstan, people aren't used to responding. And um, so they probably won't turn up. Um, they did, and they did in their droves, and they've been waiting for decades to speak. So it was fantastic. We had um, several focus groups. We had um, interactive workshops. It was just fantastic. But actually, what was great is we came up with a shared vision um, across developers, landovers, enterprises, and institutions, and communities. And some of just some of the aspects were about actually across the city, you know, the utilization of the whole city. There was this real social barrier of the up and the down. Um, and a real focus on just one area. And there was a real untapped potential into some of these areas, which I'll go into briefly, um, about perception change, about access to open space and inward investment, um, but also about collaboration. It was not only was the fact that we brought people together to engage with them, to understand the shared vision, but the need for further collaboration with the local government and those people who are using and shaping the city. So this is looking at some of the, um, we also looked at the GIS data as to, whilst we looked at the engagement and people, we're also looking at data and information to see what does this city actually look like? And actually, whilst we, we spoke about this down, um, which is, the down is actually shown up in the north, but it, it's because it's down from the mountains, which is here. You can start to see that there are a range of, all of your, the community facilities are just in one aspect. You have all of your healthcare facilities in one area. You have limited open spaces. And then also your pollu the pollution is then all defined in one area. So it's not only the social barrier, but multiple physical barriers too that we're traversing and working economically to see how this could be efficiently spread through the city. And then coming up with a, ser a series of principles, how to turn you know, the aspirations into this intellectual city, but this green city, but also building on the culture of the pre-Soviet um, culture and identity of Almaty, but also taking along the, their interpretation of the Soviet physicality and how to actually create a city for everyone, knowing about the past, but also looking to a sustainable future. So there was a few aspects we looked at of urban detox, um, a series of removing the industry from the center of the city, looking at an ever greener city and developing destinations in line with also starting to look at the silk um, road and mitigating the barrier that, um, that traverses through the city, um, but also starting to develop on these beautiful Arab state that they had as, that was used as cooling um, throughout the city, but also really starting to green these channels um, and to bring back more social activity and more environmental credentials to this area. And so actually the, the plan was um, a future plan that was flexible enough for change, but also 
those that actually fit into the aspirations of, of the people that live there um, and the local government itself, building on their culture, building on identity. And so that was Almaty as we we're moving forward. And then at a different scale completely, we we're also working on reimagining the home of Black British history for the Black Cultural Archives. Again, um, they asked for um, to enable this building to work better for them. So we did this again through focus groups, from staff focus groups, through coffee for your thoughts, to really understand what people really needed from this place of, of Black identity. Um, and it, I guess the result was that, you know, through we spoke to hundreds of people actually, in terms of people who um, were from the Black British community, from younger people, what were the barriers? And actually a lot of the issues um, that could actually be relevant to a lot of spaces in London is the barrier of the building, the barrier that it is a, a listed building, the barrier of gates, the fact that you can't see anything from the outside, that it doesn't scream of any culture. How can we actually start to bring together, you know, explore what's happening in the building, bring the archives outside, make the archives accessible and start to actually enable this as a place that can be, that can celebrate Black British history. How do you ensure you come into a place like this and you do not leave the same? And so whilst we're working together with them now, this is a project in progress, we started to work with um, a COVID ready garden, um, how to actually start to open up this space so that we could bring together people to design a space that actually started to um, reflect and, and bleed into Windrush Square. There is a place that is more accessible. We moved the reception to the front um, garden and we also started to create a place that would be welcome in a place that is safe during COVID, um, but also a place that actually starts to attract and reflect the culture through planting and will start to bring out archives into the space. So essentially, this is just a final project which I'll just whittle through. We're also working with UN Habitat in um, Nigeria um, to work with how we can build on urban renewal guidelines, but also develop on upon some of the thinking that's happening um, there. And that has been very interesting during COVID because there's been a lot of issues. There's a lot of issues now, but there's also a lot of issues during COVID. And how do you work on that as an international team abroad? Um, so what I would like to say in, um, in just to wrap this up is just that there are just multiple opportunities. Um, during the last 10 years, um, during the economic downturn, it really allowed us to build an approach to go back to our basics of what we as designers really wanted to do and to test but also um, as designers we have that creative um, way of having solutions to different questions and whilst there may not be so as many of the same type of opportunities there are always opportunities that we can start to lean on um, to create our own um, our own opportunities for growth not just about design and buildings but also about how we can start to use and um, program um, land use, engagement and people in, in all of our designs. So um, thank you. That's, that's all from me, a bit of a, a whirlwind, but yeah, that's it from me. Thank you so, so much. And that was extremely insightful. And maybe I can start with the first question, which kind of, I mean, it's in Fantastica, you kind of moved immediately after also graduating or realized that the human aspect is important. But now let's say maybe if we can focus also a bit let's say, to talk about alumni and what we're going through in the pandemic and this isolation, how would you, what would your advice would be if other people would follow, would like to follow in your footsteps, but feel extremely isolated from other human beings or being able to approach other communities or start something new? And um, I think what's been really interesting about this um, pandemic is that unusually, well, not unusually, I, I feel like we have been, a, become a lot closer as a population. We have found so many ways to be connected. Um, we've never had so many, so much interest um, as to us as a company to engage with people. Older people are now online. Younger people um, are now online. And we're all actually able to connect quite easily. We're starting, you know, people are going, are going out to help their neighbors. People are very much interested in how disparate our lives are, whether you open up the office to allow people to come in knowing that they're in shared spaces without any spaces they can share. Um, it really is an opportunity, I think, for us to look at people, um, but also tap into networks. There are 
Um, a lot of neighborhoods are now, I mean, we have a WhatsApp group for our street. There's a lot of neighborhood groups that are now forming. Local authorities have now started to put groups into place. Um, so actually, I feel like we're more, more connected than ever. And actually, this is, these, these are great opportunities for us to start to connect and really understand um, each of our real aspirations and fears. So I would say go for it. I think there's so many opportunities now with COVID. I, it's, I think it's actually quite different to the other economic downturn where people have definitely been, been a focus. Do you think that um, the recession played a big role for you, that you, you, before the recession, you might have moved in a different direction in with your architectural design skills? Or Yeah, I mean, if I look back to the work I was doing at OMA, I mean, it was just amazing. Like, budget was not an issue, and you could do anything. It felt as if you could do anything you wanted to do. Um, and whilst I thought that was fantastic, it was actually quite good to slow down after... I guess after the economic downturn, because we actually had to think about what we were doing um, mm. and whether it was relevant and whether it was necessary and how we can actually be, how we can actually work within um, a restricted area. I mean, I, I think I came back to, now I feel like I've come back to my real essence of what I wanted to do. Like if I look back to the work I was doing in DIP10 and a lot of the work I was doing at the AA, it was very much about urbanism, it was about people, it was about small interventions and large interventions. But I do wonder if um, if the economic, if we didn't have a global recession, I could just be designing iconic towers. I could, I don't know. It would have been <laughs> exactly. um, I hope I wouldn't have, but it's really hard to know because you do just end up taking opportunities that seem great at the time. Yeah, maybe also if I can I'm open the floor if, if anyone has some questions. Any rising hands? Okay, I have to see. No. <laughs> well, I think I think the great thing which you're talking about is um, that I guess we are now now even maybe more connected or more accessible than we have ever been before. Um, but I also, what I've seen, I don't know if you had the same feeling, is that maybe you are not even willing to go. I mean, I'm going now very personal, but I feel like you don't even are willing to put yourself out there. You, I think a lot of us have experienced that um, we have been totally isolated. We weren't even allowed to leave the house. And now um, we, we're not even, I don't know, I don't know how to explain this, but I feel like we have this helplessness in ourselves that we don't even see a future. Like, I understand what you're saying, that there are extreme, and all the, extraordinary possibilities out there, especially now because even the older generation are very, very accessible with um, this um, new tools. But I feel that I feel like a lot of people who have graduated with me, um, they maybe had to leave London. They, um, that's why I was asking you the question before regarding um, if, the, um, if it has changed for you, your attitude to this, this crisis, because I feel, I wonder if you have any insights how we could move forward from that absolute helplessness and feeling of isolation and that actually our dreams or our path has been quite shattered. Both that we don't really might have jobs, but even if we were, we were thinking of going somewhere very, very differently, that even that path has been stopped by us having to move or, yeah, I don't know. I think it's interesting because um, particularly in this pandemic, we, um, the future seems quite open, so I feel as if there are so many questions as to what will the high street look like, like actually mm -hmm. now with these, the new restrictions and the fact that the suburbs seem to be thriving, that, that the city centre seems to be dying, or what should new office space start to look like, um, knowing that we can work from home and we don't necessarily need that space, the space that we felt we needed or um, we don't need to necessarily be working nine to five from an office in central London or, you know, what, what does public space actually mean now? Um, we were doing a lot of work with um, Barking and Dagenham and actually people were really upset that there's no less spaces for adults and there's just spaces for children to play and make noise, but there's no space for people to be working outside or having their own area as, as adult and peace time. So, there's just so many, I feel like there's so many um, questions that require architectural solutions. So in a way, 
um, particularly in a year, if a lot of you, uh, a lot of people are graduating in a year, it could be a great opportunity actually to have these visions, um, visions work. You know, it could be going to your local high street and saying, okay, you're suffering, why don't you try this? Or it could be actually about testing some of these things live in some, in some of the public spaces or looking at, you know, empty office spaces where people will be feeling desperate because there are people that are renting office spaces that are no longer being used. So I feel like they need our help, um, which is, which is um, quite incredible because we're moving quite fast. I feel like, you know, the fact that everyone can work from home and I'm guessing you're all doing lectures from home. It's, it's, we couldn't imagine this um, a year ago that we'd, we would have moved so fast. So I feel as if we're strangely more open to change and as the architects and designers, there's just a lot of space for us to, to start to do that. And it may not be in the traditional way of through an office, but actually maybe it could be startup projects um, to go and approach people with ideas that you may have, because I really feel that it's needed. You explained a bit how you started, but maybe can you maybe go again back into your presentation like, and kind of explain how you started your own practice with your with your friend, how this kind of, like, what was your motivation? I understand that you started with smaller projects before, but then how did you jump into this bigger step to actually be really having, you're opening up your own office? I think what's interesting is there's a way of, um, there's opportunities that come and then there's also barriers of practice. And depending on what office you're at. And at the time I had, so I didn't go into, I mean, I spoke about, you know, the Middle Eastern projects. I thought it was a good um, contrast to what we were doing in 2007, the different ways and different approaches. Um, but at the time, I think I was just missing the fact that I um, had just finished a master plan. We then decided to go to consultation and the information that we found from the consultation was just incredible. And it meant we could have created the most amazing design and incredible strategies. And it just came too late. And it was something that I felt like we don't do enough in design and in practice. We don't bring people in. We don't really find out enough what is needed um, in context. Um, and so my friend is a product designer. We, we just had so many conversations about how our industries could be better and then decided to test it. So it really was a bit of just a jump for, you know, a jump, like a leap of faith. Um, and then we just thought if it doesn't work, we'll just get a job. So um, <laughs> maybe it's less like poetic and, you know, I dreamed of this, but it really was, let's just try something that, you know, we really want to, to do. And no, I think that's exactly, I think that's maybe also what we need to hear because I think, yeah, I mean, as we said, like the, our dreams, they are maybe a bit shattered, but maybe now we can be fun spontaneous and just jump into something which we feel is urgent. I see that Anna has raised her hand. I will, um, um, just, you know? sorry, Fiona, there's Banu who's waiting to ask a question first and then there's a question from, oh, okay, sorry. from Michaela and then from Miguel okay, and, sorry, then, sorry, and sorry. then Anna. Hi, Stephanie, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. It was great. Over the summer, I also read uh, a book by one of the OMA partners about like the reality within the profession, how designs get executed. And I really like the stakeholder map. And I feel like the school is not, is a bit disconnected from that sort of insight. So I was wondering if you have any recommendations on like design projects in the school, whether like how, how people, how, students such as I am um, can train ourselves to um, practice in the way that you do? Um, so there's quite a few different people who are doing it now, who are, who are doing this in a, in a live way. Um, I think for me, DIP10 was really interesting because we were on the ground and I know DIP10 is still there, there at, at the AA. Um, and we were speaking to people um, and we're speaking to those who, you know, the ambassadors of the streets that we would call them or how we can start to change some rules of the city and how um, things could change. Um, but I think actually what could be, who could be interesting to look at is, I think there's actually, 
quite a few different people. Let me, um, so Resolve Collective are really interesting. They're quite interesting to follow because you can see they're actively working with um, people to start to design aspects of space or just take up space. Um, there's also Beyond the Box Consultants. We are um, also working with them to design, help design a pavilion with younger people so they can actually start to create a space for themselves. But it's not just about that space, it's about helping them understand that the city is for them too. Um, so I feel like there's quite a few different people that are quite live uh, who are doing some live projects, which are quite interesting. I'll, if I have uh, think of any more, I'll, um, yeah, I'll come back to you. Sorry, I've, I've, gone, I've gone a bit blank, but there's quite a few people you can follow. Um, but I think it's also just something to just, it's a, it's a state of mind, um, really, actually. It's about thinking that actually we can innovate by just understanding more. It's almost as if you're designing for a, a, a small house, but actually what if you're designing for a, an office how do people like to work and how would they like to change it how can we how can we change it a bit more so it's not just the same old thing with different material mm -hmm. thank you and um, who is next anna you said did someone can you read out the question in the chat box from michaela and then from miguel okay sorry i'm on it um, so Michaela um, is saying, hi, I'd like to ask Stephanie if Urban Symbolics does follow ups to the projects they get involved or do they simply kickstart the conversation and then just leave it while the, um, with the stakeholders? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because um, we feel like actually as uh, designers, and especially when you start working in master planning, it's such a long pro process. So it can be quite hard to go back, but we're really trying to do that. So. The project that we're doing at the moment in um, Croydon, we set up this, um, we've done a strategy um, and we've worked with the community to develop that. And so as part of that strategy, there's a meanwhile strategy. So there's a series of events and there's also, you know, a, a street curator um, and, and aspects that aren't just about the physicality, but of, you know, the soft nature that actually starts to bring life to places. And so whilst we have set up a pearly panel, um, we've actually offered to give our services to help them and develop their own projects alongside. So what we'd like to do is actually be in the process to really see how, to see how that has, um, how that will actually change and adapt to really start to learn from what we're doing. And then in terms of um, follow-ups from larger projects, I think that's the problem. I think that's why we wanted to start our own because there was no follow-up and there was no learning and a lot of the projects we're doing from you know from the UK in different countries and whilst we go there maybe every two weeks we don't live there and we're unable to see some of the things that are working and aren't so um, in answer to you we would like to do that to all of our projects moving forward so that that's our aim. So we have another question and I think that's from Michaela so she says um Thank you um, for your presentation and insight. It was fantastic. My question is, how would you um, describe your transition into running your own practice? What challenges did you face, if any? And what advice might you give to designers aspiring to launching their own practice? Thanks. Well, that's quite interesting. Um, so there wasn't much of a transition. It was a bit of a, um, a massive jump. Um, and I did at the end, because I was working for a practice, um, one of the clients did ask me to um, work on a, um, a master plan with them. So we did have a first project. Um, I think actually one of the biggest challenges we faced is that people didn't believe in our process or our approach and they were adamant that it made no sense and that this is not how the industry worked. And so what advice I would give is that, you know, now we're in COVID times and everything is about people and the welfare and everyone's very aware of everyone's disparities. Now everyone's on board. So for me, I one of the pieces of advice I'd say is if you really believe in what you're trying to do, try and stick to it, <laughs> regardless of what people say. I mean, sometimes you can learn a lot from people's comments. So sometimes it's worth tweaking, but then some people just will disagree. And you, it, it, I really do believe you need to follow what you think is true. Um, I think then in terms of other challenges is obviously getting jobs. Um, our mantra was, 
the longer we continue, the more resilient we will be. And so it's very easy to be almost, you know, have we got enough work? Have we not? Um, but it really is, um, it really, we are really still testing it and we are just two years in. Um, but also, I guess what's really important is relationship building. And I think that's what we've discovered the most is, you know, having good relationships with your clients, developing relationships with people, um, getting out there and maintaining that. But um, I, yeah relationships with people is just um extremely important like particularly cl clients um which is not something you'd necessarily learn about whilst you're studying um and when you're working at other places um i think it's really important to know that all of your colleagues and your bosses and people below you are your networks um so it's really good to maintain those good relationships um and to continue it because they could be the source of your of your next job Thank you. Um, Anna, you're unmuted if you would like to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for your um, presentation. It was very interesting. I had a question. How did you get involved in projects like um, in Kazakhstan? Did you approach them yourself or they approached you? Like, how, did, how does it work? Um, so with that project, it was, an, it was an open bid. And so we bid together with um, Hatch, who invited us on. Um, so that was, yeah, so we were approached by Hatch to ask if we could join them to do, to work on the spatial side whilst they worked on the economic side, but it was, a, it was an open bid. Um, so that's how we got onto that. So, um, some, so in that instance, it was an open bid, but sometimes it was from other relationships that we had in, in previous practices for some other master plans. Um, and then in Croydon, that was also a bid, um, so there's always different ways. Um, I think what we've realized is practice, there's just, there's so many different ways of getting work and you don't always know where they come from. Sometimes it's through talks, sometimes it's through workshops, but it, I guess it's just about people knowing who you are. Okay, thank you. And does anyone else have has a question? Carlos, maybe? No. <laughs> Um, well, hmm, I was thinking, oh, I have a question. I think, Miguel has a question. Oh, sorry again. Sorry, where is it? Oh, sorry to, to come up again. <laughs> it's just because I thought it was very fascinating, like the, your approach to, to all the urban issues with a design and product designer. And uh, because nowadays we have like this situation in which uh, user experience is like a buzzword, right? And so they are talking about this all the time and then they are saying that uh, all the digital problems go through this process of um, interacting, pardon me, interacting with, uh, with the users and then coming up with uh, better products, right? And uh, it's really interesting because your approach kind of go this way, goes this way, like, uh, but actually using architecture and urban design. And uh, I'm not sure if there are many people doing it that way, right? Because uh, these disc group discussions, these focus groups, you can see it here and there, but I mean, uh, bringing these methodologies of uh, user experience, have you seen anyone doing that? Or is it something that is still new to architecture and urban design, I wonder? So I've met a few people who said, oh, I'm a product designer and I'm really interested in in working, um, in working in the field. So I know there's quite a few people on the outskirts who are trying to get involved and Hemingway Design is who, I think he started Red or Dead. He's now doing a lot of town centers, which is just incredible. Um, and I'm not sure if he's necessarily using that approach. Um, but it was interesting because I guess, you know, as you're saying, you don't hear much about it. And we were told at the beginning that it does not work like that. And so, for example, if we need to get a, the correct demographic, we will incentivize people to actually be involved because we understand there's a lot of barriers to participation. You know, a lot of people don't have the time. That's why they don't get involved. A lot of people aren't empowered. They don't feel like their voice matters um, or can actually make a change. And so we actually do quite a bit of work to make sure people feel included and involved and bring people to the table to actually start to to do that but no I haven't really come across another group who's doing it um 
So hopefully, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting way of doing things. So hopefully it continues to go along that path. But um, I haven't personally, there, there may be a few out there that are doing that. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so how, how do you empower those demographics that don't feel empowered, that don't feel like their voice matters? How do you, what are the tools you use to actually get them involved and to kind of make them see how important it is for them to be involved? And um, so it's quite interesting. I think sometimes it's a bit iterative um, and there isn't necessarily like a one size fits all. But I guess once we see who we need to find, then we start to see why these people aren't involved. Um, so a lot of people, yeah, their instance is, you know, you ask them, how would you like your area to be improved? Or what? And they're like, well, it doesn't matter because I live in council housing and, you know, that's not how it works. And so... I guess in some instances where we invite them to groups and they come, um, sometimes it's actually just about being invited. Um, the fact that we go to them, we don't wait for them to come to us, that also makes a difference. Um, but what we also notice, like when we do our demographic panels, um, we're very careful about how we chair, how we chair and how we run it, because in that instance, um, we've had people, you know, we've had, we tend to do follow up calls after to see how it went. And in some instances, people say, you know, oh, I felt like I couldn't say anything or what I said doesn't matter or I feel like everyone is more qualified than me. And so sometimes it takes a bit of coaching um, or just actually just explaining how important it, it is to them and how, you know, they are also future, part, future users of their area and, and city. So it's, there's not necessarily one way that fits, you know, for everyone, but we just really do try and make sure that we are just trying to be as inclusive as possible. Um, I think we're just trying to be aware of it in the first instance. Um, but I'll let you know if we develop better tools as we go as we go along. Sorry, um, Carlos has a question. Um, um, I unmuted you. Um, Stephanie, just a quick, thank you very much. Fantastic stuff, nice to see. In terms of that uh, final question, um, one of the things uh, that has worried me recently, actually, is uh, the developers using um, fake versions of what you do. Mm -hmm. So I went to this presentation on mean time space in, in uh, Central St. Martins. Uh, and land lease, you know, just justified everything done in Houston because they supposedly done a focus group and spoken to a few people, you know, and they seem to be uh, slightly predatory on the local schools. You know, they ask kids what they thought. Um, and I felt very dubious because I think what you do is fantastic. I think uh, the work that Publica does as a firm, you know, to, to actually look at sites before anything happens in them is absolutely critical. Uh, do, 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 have you found that to be the case, that people do what you do as a pretend in order to sort of say that they've done a, a social dimension? They do. I think what we found really interesting is a lot of people don't even bother to pretend, <laughs> which, which is quite bizarre. Um, and I guess what's interesting about developers is that it always comes at the end. So it's almost, I mean, they've got so far, they don't make a change. Like then they say, oh, this is, this person said it was great. But I guess what we're trying to say is if you try and bring them at the beginning, then you might actually find out something that's useful. Um, and I do think it is a real issue about bringing people on board at the end or what we have found is what does worry me is where people bring people on board to then remove them from their housing, which um, who are then also trying to get other um, people on board to agree with their plans without realizing what's actually happening. So I think also with our whole capacity to build, I think it's just really important so that people understand what they're agreeing to. Um, because when sometimes these shiny new plans that they're agreeing to do not include them or any of their family members, um, I find that quite an issue. I mean, we were asked once um, to get a community on board so that we could, to, so that they could tell us how terrible their flats are, so that they can compulsory purchase all of their homes. And I mean, obviously we rejected that and we decided not to go ahead, but 
yeah, there is a there is a real worry, and I think with this new policy of the new white paper with the local with the government that put forward now with you know having um, consultation early on, I think there is a bit of a worry that developers do just use it as a tick box and don't use it so it's meaningful. Um, but I think what we're trying to do is also try to make it meaningful to developers so that they see how they could actually use it to benefit both of them. Um, but yeah, in agreement, there's always someone trying to, trying and, to do it. And, and further to that, just a question in terms of, um, um, have you found that it's, uh, you're obviously fantastically optimistic, which I like, but um, <laughs> is there, I mean, have you have you had to fight for your fee? Because you know, a, a lot of a lot of sort of urban uh, development sort of argues that it has to be as efficient as possible and make as much profit as possible. So they say any any form of immersion or consultation or participation. Oh my God, that costs money. Yeah. And so, have you had to fight? Have you had to fight quite hard for your fees in terms of uh, the when you get given the projects or you work with the projects? Or is it done through charities? Or is it done through uh, different budgets or so what we'll try to do I guess particularly with the bids we're going for um, everyone is about community now so it works in our favor so we will price it in so that's what we try to do and because especially with local authorities they do need um, yeah they very much need to be involved and they need evidence of it um, in other aspects yes it's been difficult there was one project we worked on in Lebanon where we actually showed them that they could reduce their, their actually build out rates with the insight from, from the participants. So in that aspect, it worked, but not from a, not because they bought into engagement, but just because they bought into the fact that they can actually use the insight to provide a product that actually met the needs of that, that consultant, uh, no, of, the, of the people. And then in other aspects, people just say, please leave that aspect out. So, um, yeah, there is, we're trying to work on this symbiotic approach so that everyone can see how they can benefit. But, and um, there is that, but I do feel like somehow this, the atmosphere right now um, is really conducive um, to it. So it's, it's working in our benefit at the moment. So hopefully that lasts. And I am very positive. <laughs> but, um, yeah, sometimes they do ask us to do the minimum. That's, that's the only. Um, aspect as well. Thank you. And I have, I have another question. I think also you were talking about that you um, you try to get as much as possible people involved and then make them also feel that their voice is relevant. But how do you approach them from the beginning? Is that um, so we have so we'll have we'll, we'll know who we need to approach. And then we'll try, I guess what we try to do is try and find, so for example, um, in Croydon, we we're working, we just, we went to the food hub. So you worked with the people that actually worked at the food hub because then they have, um, they have trust with people that are there. So we know sometimes that actually as designers or people that are associated with development, we aren't always the people that people want to trust. Um, so we go to people and we call them like trust routes because they're almost like routes into trust using other people's um, ways of getting to other people that may not usually be involved. Um, so depending on that, we will go to them. So in, um, we're also trying to find a young contingent of people. So we went through the youth, pro youth projects that were happening. There was multiple youth projects. We went through the schools. Um, but we also started to find there's also a local mosque that, that had their own scouts groups and club networks. Um, so we'll go through multiple ways of trying to trying to reach out to people. Um, but we will we'll always know who we want to, um, to to get to. And then there's just different ways. Sometimes it's through Facebook groups, um, but we really will use social media. We'll use um, we'll try and go through networks first as opposed to individuals. And because we feel like we get a wider reach. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Does anyone else still have the question? Hmm, I guess not. But I, I really want to thank you. This was incredible, and I think it's such a such a relevant the, like, 
subject and also I mean we have been realizing that this is something which hasn't been really done before and is extremely urgent and I'm very very happy to hear that also I think this is a time maybe more people feel an urge to participate and see the relevance of your work and yeah I think maybe we can end here and I want to really thank you for showing up and giving all these insights for us and thank, thank you for the audience to come and <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs>